This week in environmental science, we'll be taking a look at Chapter 14, Global Climate Change. Here's our objectives for the chapter. To understand Earth's climate system, the human influences on climate, the methods of climate research, the impacts of global climate change, future trends and impacts, and responding to climate change. Our central case study focuses on the rising seas around the Maldives Islands. Tourists think that the Maldives Islands are a paradise, but they've been experiencing some problems. In the 20th century, the uh, Earth seas rose about 20 centimeters, which translates to about 8 inches, and they've had more flooding and contamination of their drinking water by salt water that's been coming in with the flooding. Small nations and islands like this seem to have a very small carbon footprint, but they're taking the brunt of the problem here from other nations that do have a larger carbon footprint. In fact, uh, it's not just the Maldives that could face problems in the future. We have to also remember that the U.S. has coastal areas as well, and those coastal areas, even around the world, will face challenges from these rising sea levels. The Superstorm Sandy in 2012 was a wake-up call, and it made it very apparent to places like New York and New Jersey that there's some costs to this rising sea level. Impacts from rising seas are just a few of the many imminent consequences of global climate change, and in one way or another, climate change will affect each and every one of us for the remainder of our lifetimes. Putting solutions into action stands as our central challenge for our society today and in the foreseeable future. Climate change is the fastest developing area of environmental science today, and if you're a student in your teens or 20s, the accelerating change in our climate might well be the major event of your lifetime and the phenomenon that most shapes your future. Climate describes an area's long-term atmospheric conditions. It includes temperature, precipitation, wind, and humidity. And then remember from our last chapter, weather is the short-term conditions at a localized site. Global climate change describes modifications in the Earth's climate, including changes in temperature, precipitation, and the frequency and intensity of storms. Global warming and globi global climate change are not the same, but sometimes people use those names synony synonymously, but indeed they are different. Global warming is just a small aspect of global climate change. It's an increase in the Earth's average temperature. Earth's climate has actually varied naturally through time and goes through different cycles, but the difference is, is that in today's climate change, differences are happening at an extremely rapid rate, faster than what the, the Earth would normally experience. And we know today that these changes are due to human fossil fuel combustion and deforestation. Understanding climate change requires understanding how our planet's climate works. Some, research, some researchers point out that the term climate change actually is too mild sounding to actually describe the problems that are on the horizon. Instead, maybe a more accurate term would be climate disruption. Three natural factors exert the most influence on Earth's climate. One of the factors is the sun, which is where Earth gets all of its energy from. Without it, Earth would be dark and frozen and not able to support life. Remember, the sun is also where plants get their energy to do photosynthesis. The second aspect is atmosphere. And without it, Earth's temperature would be much, much colder, probably 
Oh, 59 degrees Fahrenheit colder on average. And our differences between night and day temperature would be much more extreme. The atmosphere helps to absorb uh, the sun's radiation. Clouds, land, ice, and water absorb 70% of the incoming solar radiation, and the remaining 30% is reflected back into space. A third factor is the oceans. They help to shape the climate by acting as a storage area for heat and carbon dioxide and moisture. Our planet receives about 340 watts of electricity per square meter from the sun, and it naturally reflects and emits the same amount. As the Earth's surface absorbs solar radiation, the surface increases in temperature and emits infrared radiation. With wavelengths longer than those of the visible light spectrum, and that would be in an area that we would not be able to see with the human naked eye. Atmospheric gases having three or more atoms in their molecules tend to absorb infrared radiation. These would include gases like water vapor, ozone, O3, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, as well as halocarbons and other uh, gases, and these are all known as greenhouse gases. They help to re-emit infrared energy, and some of the energy is lost to space. The greenhouse effect is the energy that travels downward that warms the atmosphere and the planet's surface. Greenhouse gases differ in their ability to warm the troposphere and the surface of the Earth. This is called global warming potential. It's the relative ability of one molecule of a greenhouse gas to contribute to global warming. It's expressed in relation to carbon dioxide with the potential equal to one. That's the standard. So nitrous oxide is 298 times as potent as carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide contributes most to the greenhouse effect though. It is less potent but far more abundant than all the other gases. And it's the major type of human caused emissions. The greenhouse effect is a natural occurring phenomenon and those gases have always been there in the atmosphere. But we're concerned with the anthropogenic or the human caused intensification of the greenhouse effect because of the excess gases that we are putting into the atmosphere as humans. We've increased these concentrations of gases beyond what we've ever experienced before. In fact, carbon dioxide has increased from 280 parts per million to 399 parts per million since the 1700s and the highest it's been in 800,000 years, maybe even within the last 20 million years. We can see in the graph below how carbon dioxide has really increased since the Industrial Revolution. Burning fossil fuels transfers carbon dioxide from underground deposits where they're stored in the earth to the atmosphere. And that's the main reason that carbon dioxide levels have increased. And deforestation contributes to this rising atmospheric carbon dioxide because plants store that carbon in their tissues. And so less carbon dioxide is absorbed from the atmosphere as we, we remove more and more trees and plants from the earth. Methane is another greenhouse gas. We can find it in fossil fuels and livestock, landfills and crops and rice. And those levels have increased 2.6 times since 1750. Nitrous oxide is another greenhouse gas found in feedlots, chemical manufacturing plants, auto emissions, 
and synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. Those levels have risen 20% since 1750. Ozone levels have risen 36% because of photochemical smog, although the Montreal Protocol has reduced halocarbons or CFCs. Water vapor is the most abundant greenhouse gas and it contributes most to the natural greenhouse effect, but those concentrations have not changed. There's other factors that help warm or cool the surface of the earth, and these include aerosols. These are microscopic droplets and particles that can have either a warming or a cooling effect. Soot from black carbon aerosols causes warming by absorbing solar energy, but most tropospheric aerosols cool the atmosphere by reflecting the sun's rays. Sulfate aerosols come from fossil fuel combustion and it can actually help slow global warming, but only in short term. Volcanic eruptions reduce the sunlight reaching the Earth's surface and cool the Earth, but then are cleared from the atmosphere later. This occurred in 1991 with the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. To measure the degree of impact that a given factor exerts on Earth's temperature, scientists calculate what's called its radiative forcing. This is the amount of change in thermal energy that the factor actually causes. Positive forcing warms the surface, whereas negative forcing cools it. When scientists sum up the effects of all the factors, they find that the Earth is now experiencing radiative forcing at about 2.3 watts per meter squared. This means that our planet today is receiving and retaining 2.3 watts per meter squared more thermal energy than it's emitting into space. By contrast, the pre-industrial Earth of 1750 was in balance, emitting as much radiation as it was receiving. This extra amount is equivalent to the power converted into heat and light by 200 incandescent light bulbs across a football field. Earth is estimated naturally to receive and give off about 340 watts per meter squared. So if we do the math, we could say that Earth is experiencing radiative forcing of 1.6 watts per meter squared, more thermal energy than it's emitting into space. Atmospheric composition is one of several factors that influences climate. Other factors include variation in energy released by the sun, absorption of carbon dioxide by the oceans, ocean circulation patterns, and cyclic changes in Earth's rotation and orbit. However, scientific data indicates that none of these four natural factors can fully explain the rapid climate change that we're experiencing today. The sun varies in the amount of radiation that it emits over short and long time scales. However, scientists are concluding that the variation in solar energy reaching our planet in re recent centuries has simply not been great enough to, to drive significant temperature changes on the Earth's surface. Estimates place the radiative forcing of natural changes in solar output at only about 0 0.05 watts per meter squared, less than any of the other anthropogenic causes. Ocean absorption accounts for how the oceans hold 50 times more carbon than the atmosphere. It shows that global warming does not prevent it. As oceans warm, they absorb less carbon dioxide, helping to accelerate the warming. This is known as a positive feedback effect. Ocean water exchanges heat with the atmosphere, and ocean currents move energy from place to place. For example, the ocean's thermohaline circulation system moves warm tropical water northward toward Europe, 
providing Europe a far milder climate than it would otherwise have. Scientists are now studying whether freshwater input from Greenland's melting ice sheet might shut down this warm water flow. And in, this is, could be an occurrence that could plunge Europe into much colder conditions than it normally experiences. El Nino and La Nina events can help change regional weather over time, causing dry areas to get wetter while wet areas get drier. This would lead to impacts on wildlife, agriculture, and fisheries. In the 1920s, Serbian mathematician Milutin Milankovic described three types of periodic changes in Earth's rotation and orbit around the Sun. Over thousands of years, our planet wobbles on its axis, and it varies the tilt of its axis and experiences change in the shape of its orbit, all in regular long-term cycles of different lengths. These variations are known as Milankovitch cycles, and they alter the way solar radiation is distributed over Earth's surface. By modifying patterns of atmospheric heating, these cycles trigger long-term climate variation. This includes periodic episodes of glaciation, during which the global surface temperature drops and ice sheets advance from the poles toward the mid-latitudes. These cycles are highly influential in the very long term, but science shows that they do not account for the very recent rapid extreme climate change that we're experiencing today. To understand any phenomenon that changes, we need to study the past and the present and the future patterns. Scientists can monitor the present day climate but they have to devise means to infer what it would have been like in the past and devise models to what it would look like in the future. To understand past climate, scientists decipher clues from the thousands or millions of years ago by taking advantage of the record-keeping capacity of the natural world. Proxy indicators are types of indirect evidence that serve as proxies or substitutes for direct measurements. For instance, ice caps, ice sheets, and glaciers can hold clues to the Earth's climate history. We can look at trapped bubbles of air in ice cores to, to get an idea of what Earth's atmosphere used to be composed of and how the greenhouse gas concentrations have changed to what temperature would have once looked like amount of snowfall and solar activity. Even the frequency of fires and volcanic eruptions can be inferred from this indirect data. Other indicators include the pollen that's preserved in sediments, tree rings, the thickness or thinness of them, pack rat middens. Pack rat middens are rodent dens in which plant parts can be preserved for centuries in arid regions. And then also coral reefs can give us clues which reveal aspects of oceans chemistry. Data from the EPICA ice core reveal changes across 800,000 years. EPICA stands for European Project for Ice Core in Antarctica. Here in the picture below, we can see a scientist examining an ice core. Direct measurements tell us about the present. Today we can document daily fluctuations in weather, such as temperature, rainfall, wind speed, and air pressure. Ocean and atmospheric chemistry were first measured in 1958. And hourly air samples from Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii show that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations have increased from 350, excuse me, 315 parts per million to 399 parts per million since 1958. To understand how climate systems function, 
and to predict future climate change, scientists simulate climate processes with sophisticated computer programs. These are called climate models. They are programs that combine what's known about atmospheric circulation, ocean circulation, atmosphere-ocean interactions, and feedback cycles to simulate climatic processes. If a model accurately can reconstruct what's happening currently, then we can infer that it will accurately predict the future climate. But it can be hard because climate and feedback loops are so complex. But we're always improving our technology and improving our information In the science behind the story, we ask how do climate models actually work? They're increasing, increasingly vital for our society. They help predict what conditions will confront us in the future. But how do scientists create a climate model? A long series of mathematical equations are added to the model. The, the equations are integrated with data on Earth's landforms, hydrology, vegetation, and atmosphere, and the Earth's surface is divided into a layered grid that looks like the picture to the right. Models that incorporate both natural and anthropogenic factors predict observed climate trends the best. Here we can look at natural factors in the diagram below and then natural and human factors and extrapolate kind of a middle of the road of how things will be. Evidence that climate has changed is everywhere. Even fishermen in the Maldives and ranchers from Texas and homeowners from Florida have evidence. We can't blame any single weather event on climate change but extreme weather is part of a pattern that's backed by an immense volume of scientific data. We're experiencing more intense storms, multi-year droughts, hurricanes, and other events at a bigger rate and more intense factors than ever before. In extreme weather events are indeed part of a real pattern backed by tremendous volume of scientific evidence. Here we can see a diagram of some of these trends and impacts. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, was established in 1988. It's composed of hundreds of international scientists and government representatives. The IPCC released its fifth assessment report in 2014. And documents put out by them observe trends in surface temperature, precipitation patterns, snow and ice cover, sea levels and storm intensity and predicts future changes in wildlife ecosystems and human societies. It discusses strategies to pursue in response to climate change. Temperatures continue to rise. Average surface temperatures have increased 0.9 degrees Celsius in the past 100 years. Most of the increase has been actually since 1975 only. Since 2000, we've experienced 13 of the 15 warmest years. And we can see some diagrams of this data below. This graph shows temperature changes from 1991 to 2012. You can find where you live and look at how it has changed. The future will be even hotter. In the next 20 years, temperatures will rise 0.4 degrees Celsius. And at the end of the 21st century, temperatures will be 1.8 to 4 degrees Celsius higher than today's. And we'll have unusually hot days and heat waves. Polar areas will have some of the most intense warming. 
and sea surface temperatures will rise. Hurricanes and tropical storms will increase in power and in duration. And as we know, these are going to affect our coastal areas and our islands. Projected increases in surface temperature for 2081 to 2100 relative to 1986 to 2005 are showed below. Precipitation's changing too. Some regions are receiving more rain and snow than normal. Other areas are receiving less. In the U.S. Southwest, droughts have become more frequent and more severe. These droughts can harm agriculture and promote soil erosion and reduce water supplies and trigger fires. In dry, humid re regions, heavy rains are causing flooding. These floods can kill people, can destroy homes, and inflict billions of dollars in damage. For example, in 2008, Iowa and the Midwest experienced floods. Precipitation will increase at high latitudes and will decrease at low and middle latitudes and will worsen our water shortages in poor nations. Extreme weather is becoming the new normal. The sheer number of extreme weather events in the recent years like droughts, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes and snowstorms, cold snaps and heat waves has caught everyone's attention and weather records are being broken left and right. In the United States, 2012 was the hottest year ever recorded. The nation experienced a freakish heat wave in March, a summer severe drought that devastated agriculture across three-fifths of the country, and Hurricane Sandy, which inflicted over $60 billion in damage. Scientific data summarized by the U.S. Climate Extremes Index confirms that the frequency of extreme events in the U.S. has been rising since 1970. In 2012, research by Jennifer Francis of Rutgers University and Stephen Vavris of the University of Wisconsin revealed a mechanism that may explain how and why global warming leads to these more extreme weather events. Because warming has been greatest in the Arctic, this has weakened the intensity of the northern hemisphere's polar jet stream, a high altitude air current that blows west to east and meanders north and south, influencing the weather across North America and Eurasia. As the jet stream slows down, its meandering loops become longer. These long, lazy loops move west to east more slowly and may get stuck in a north-south orientation for longer periods of time. Meteorologists call this an atmospheric blocking pattern because it blocks the eastward movements of weather systems. When this happens, a rainy system that might normally blow past a city in a day or two could be held in place for several days, or uh, that would cause flooding or dry conditions over a farming region that might uh, last two weeks could be there for much, much longer. Hot spells last longer also, and so do cold spells. The mountaintop glaciers are disappearing, lending even more evidence. Glaciers on tropical mountaintops have disappeared even. In the remaining 25 of 150 glaciers in Gla Glacier National Park will be gone by 2030, reducing summertime water supplies to millions. Take a look on the right at Jack Jackson Glacier, pictured in 1911, versus what it looks like today. The melting of Greenland's Arctic ice sheets ac accelerating as well. Warmer waters melting Antarctica's coastal ice shelves. The interior snow is increasing because of more precipitation, though. Melting ice exposes darker, less reflective surfaces. The term lower albedo causes even more melting yet. It's like a positive feedback effect here. Nations are rushing to exploit underwater oil and mineral resources made available 
by newly opened shipping lanes. Even more positive feedback happening there. Permafrost, which is the permanently frozen ground in the tundra, is thawing. And it's destabilizing soil and buildings and also releasing methane into our atmosphere. Runoff from melting glaciers and ice have caused sea levels to rise. As the oceans warm, they expand, leading to beach erosion, coastal floods, intrusion of salt water into our natural freshwater aquifers, and storm surges. In the diagram below, we can look at the United States and see some of our most vulnerable areas on the coastline. A storm surge is a temporary and localized rise in sea levels generated by a storm. The higher that the sea level is to begin with, the further inland a storm can reach. The impact of storm surges was painfully clear in 2013 when Typhoon Haiyan struck the Philippines. One of the strongest storms ever recorded, it took 7,000 lives and caused over $1.5 billion in damage. In 1987, unusually high waves struck the Maldives and triggered a campaign to build a seawall around Malay, the nation's capital. Now called the Great Wall of Malay, it's intended to protect the buildings and roads by dissipating the energy of incoming waves during storm surges. In the United States, Superstorm Sandy demonstrated the impact of storm surges and the massive hurricane battered the eastern part of our nation in October 2012, causing $65 billion in damage and leaving 160 people dead and thousands homeless. In New Jersey, thousands of homes were destroyed, iconic boardwalks were washed away, and coastal communities were inundated with salt water and sand. In New York, Economic activity ground to a halt as tunnels and subway stations flooded and vehicles and buildings suffered damage. A fire even broke out amid flooded homes in Queens and destroyed a whole neighborhood. As we can see, these rising seas can displace millions of people from these coastal areas. Many will have to invest in costly efforts to protect against high tides and storm surges. Here's some of the areas that could be most affected, including Bangladesh, a densely populated poor region, the storm-prone areas of Florida, the coastal city, cities of Houston, our U.S. Gulf Coast, and our Pacific Islands could even have to be evacuated. When places have to evacuate, this leads to environmental refugees. As carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere rise, the oceans absorb more carbon dioxide. So far, the oceans have absorbed roughly one quarter of the CO2 we've added to the atmosphere. And this alters ocean chemistry, making the ocean more acidic. This is known as ocean acidification. Ocean acidification can threaten all marine animals like corals, clams, oysters, and crabs that actually pull carb uh, carbonate ions out of the seawater to build their exoskeletons of calcium carbonate. As seawater becomes more acidic, carbonate ions then become less available and calcium carbonate begins to dissolve, jeopardizing the existence of these animals. Global ocean chemistry has already decreased by 0.1 pH unit, and that would correspond to a 26% rise in hydrogen ion concentration. Initial impacts on coral and oysters are already being seen, and by 2100, scientists predict that the seawater will decline in pH or become more acidic by another 0.06 to 0.32 units. This could be enough to actually destroy all living coral reefs on our planet. And this could be catastrophic 
for all marine, marine life and even our fisheries. Coral reefs can face other additional risks from climate change. Warmer waters contribute to the deadly coral bleaching and more intense storms can actually physically damage them as well. Organisms are adapted to their environments and they're affected when these environments even change a little bit. Global warming modifies temperature dependent phenomena such as timing and migration and breeding. And species will move toward the poles or up in elevation. 20 to 30 percent of species will be threatened with extinction and rare species will be pushed out of preserves. More carbon dioxide can increase plant growth but drought, fire, and disease will decrease plant growth. And fewer plants means more carbon dioxide in the air and that's a positive feedback effect again. Biologists are recording spatial shifts in organisms like how plants and animals are moving towards the poles and upward in elevation such as these birds and these pikas in the diagrams to the right. Societies are already feeling the impacts of climate change, agriculture, shortened growing seasons, decreased production, and their crops are more susceptible to droughts and hunger is increasing in many developing nations. Forestries experiencing more fires, more invasive species, insects and disease outbreaks. Human health can be impacted by climate change. These heat waves and stress can cause death, especially on our older people, our older population, which is increasing. Respiratory ailments seem to be increasing and expansion of tropical diseases is happening. There's more drowning, more diseases, and more sanitation problems because of flooding. People will experience a variety of economic costs and benefits from the impacts of climate change. But on the whole, researchers predict that the cost will outweigh the benefits. Climate change is also expected to widen the gap between the rich and the poor. Impacts vary regionally and each U.S. region will face its own challenges. For the U.S., impacts are assessed by the U.S. Global Change Research Program. They put out a 2014 National Climate Assessment and scientists reported and predicted the following. Temperature increases of 1.7 to 5.6 degrees Celsius higher, worse droughts and flooding, decreased crop yields, water shortages, health problems and disease, higher sea levels, beach erosion, destroyed wetlands, changes to forests as a result of drought, fire and pests, more grasslands and deserts, fewer forests, and undermining of Alaskan buildings and roads. Predictions from two climate models show that temperature increases will be much smaller if emissions are lowered. They have the reduced emission scenario here versus the continued emission scenario. You can definitely see a big difference if we reduce our emissions. Are we responsible for climate change? Scientists agree that increased greenhouse gases are causing global warming. Increasing greenhouse gases due to the burning of fossil fuels and the loss of carbon absorbing vegetation due to deforestation is having a huge impact. Despite overwhelming evidence for climate change, many in the U.S. deny what's happening or they make fun of it. People debate whether it's real and whether humans are to blame. Think tanks and a few scientists question it. The news media presents both sides despite the evidence of climate change. More and more influential people and everyday citizens have concluded that climate change is escalating and we must begin to respond. Most people now accept that we are changing the earth and are looking for solutions. Mitigation 
is the pursual of actions that reduce gle uh, greenhouse gas emissions to lessen the severity of climate change. And it includes energy efficiency, renewable energy, protecting soil, and preventing deforestation. Adaptation is to pursue strategies to minimize the Im impacts on us. They include seawalls and coping with drought and less water. And we need to pursue both. We're developing solutions in electricity generation and transportation. Electrical generation is the largest source of U.S. CO2 emissions. And there's strategies to reduce fossil fuel use, such as conservation, efficiency, and cleaner and renewable energy, cogeneration, and more efficient appliances. Cogeneration is the fact that power producers can capture excess heat from electricity generation and then put that to use. Carbon capture is another way it removes carbon dioxide from power plant emissions. And carbon storage or sequestration. This is the storage of carbon underground in old oil deposits and salt mines. Currently we can't store enough carbon dioxide to make a difference. Currently our automobile is still highly inefficient. Solutions include fuel efficient hybrids and electric cars to drive less and use mass transit and to live closer to your job so that you can either bike or walk. Agriculture needs to develop sustainable practices and reduce their methane emissions from rice and cattle and grow renewable biofuels. Forestry, we need to reforest our cleared land and preserve existing forests and adopt sustainable forestry practices. In waste management, we need to treat our wastewater and generate electricity by incinerating wastes and recover methane from landfills. And individuals themselves can recycle, compost, reduce, and reuse their goods. There's no magic bullet for mitigating climate change. Reductions can be achi achieved with technology that we can use right away. And everybody needs to do their part. Just 15 strategies can eliminate 1 billion tons of carbon per year by 2050 if deployed on a large scale. Seven of the 15 would stabilize carbon dioxide emissions. What role should government play to reduce emissions? Should the government mandate change through laws and regulation, impose no policies and hope for solutions, or give private entities incentives to reduce emissions? These are all good questions. Many businesses and politicians have opposed all government action. They fear it will cost industry and consumers. In 2007, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the EPA could indeed regulate carbon dioxide as a pollutant. In 2009, the House of Representatives cap and trade system did not pass the Senate. It would have forced industries to compete to reduce emissions for financial gain. In 2013, President Obama announced that he'd take steps to address climate change. His climate action plan urged the EPA to speed its regulation power of newer power plants and to begin re regulating existing ones. It aimed to jumpstart renewable energy development, modernize the electric grid, finance clean coal and carbon storage efforts, improve automotive fuel economy, protect and restore forests, and encourage energy efficiency. Climate change is a global problem, so the world's policymakers have tried to tackle it with international treaties. In 1992, most nations signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which outlined a plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2000 through a voluntary approach. Emissions kept rising, however, so nations forged a binding treaty to require emission reductions. 
drafted in 1997 in Kyoto, Japan, the Kyoto Protocol mandated signatory nations by the period 2008 to 2012 to reduce emissions of six greenhouse gases to levels below those of 1990. And the treaty took effect in 2005 after Russia became the 127th nation to ratify it. The United States was the only developed nation not to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. U.S. leaders objected to how it required industrialized nations to reduce emissions, but did not require the same of rapidly industrializing nations like uh, uh, China and India. Signatory nations have actually increased emissions by 3.2%. Nations, not parties to the accord, including China, India, and the United States, increased their emissions still more. The 2009 Copenhagen Conference ended in discord. Cancun's 2010 meeting was more productive. Developed nations agreed to transfer clean energy technology to developing nations. They agreed to help tropical nations reduce forest loss, and China and India will reduce their emissions in principle. Most of these plans and promises have not yet come to pass. In Durban, South Africa in 2011, negotiators failed to design a new treaty. Instead, nations agreed to a roadmap toward a legally binding international deal in 2015, which would come into force only after 2020. This plan was reaffirmed at the 2012 conference in Doha, Qatar, and the 2013 conference in Warsaw, Poland. In Doha, negotiators also extended the Kyoto Protocol until 2020. However, a number of nations backed out of the Kyoto extension and the treaty now applies to only about 15% of the world's emissions. Most scientists reacted with disappointment and alarm at having to wait until 2020 for a meaningful agreement, warning that this is creating a lost decade during which climate change is only intensifying. Will emissions cuts actually hurt the economy? The U.S. Senate, China, and India feel reducing emissions will hurt the economy. Economic vitality does not need higher emissions. Germany, England, and France cut their emissions while still keeping a high standard of living. Industrialized nations gain from developing and marketing new technologies, and the future belongs to nations willing to act now. States and cities are advancing climate change policy. The U.S. federal government is not acting. So, state and local governments are. The U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement will meet or beat Kyoto's guidelines. California's Global Warming Solutions Act seeks to cut emissions by 25% by 2020 and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or the RGGI, in 10 northeastern states, set up a cap-and-trade program. Emissions trading programs seek to harness the economic efficiency of market capitalism to control pollution by allowing business, industry, or utilities flexibility in how they do so. Supporters of emission trading uh, argue that this approach provides the fairest, least expensive, and most effective method of reducing emissions. Polluters choose how to cut their emissions and are given financial incentives for reducing them below the legally required amount. Cap and trade programs are intended to be self-sustaining. The price of permits fluctuates freely in the market creating the same kinds of financial incentives as any other commodity that's bought and sold. As an example of how a cap-and-trade program works, consider the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. 
Each state decides which polluting sources participate. Each state sets a cap on total carbon dioxide emissions that it allows. Each emission source gets one permit for each ton it emits up to the amount of the cap. Each state lowers its cap over time. Sources with too few permits must reduce emissions and buy permits from others or pay for carbon offsets. Sources with too many permits can sell them and any source emitting more than the permitted will be penalized. The European Union Emission Trading Scheme of 2005 is the world's largest cap-and-trade program. The governments had allocated too many permits, and industries had little incentive to cut emissions, and permits lost 90% of their value. The European Union Emission Trading Scheme is trying to fix these problems. Permits work only if government policies limit emissions. Critics say cap-and-trade systems are not effective. Many of these critics would prefer that the governments would enact what's called a carbon tax instead. In this approach, governments charge polluters a fee for each unit of greenhouse gases they emit. Polluters have financial incentive then to reduce their emissions. Carbon taxes have been introduced in over 20 nations. In the United States, Boulder, Colorado taxes electricity consumption, and Montgomery County in Maryland taxes power plants. However, polluters pass costs on to consumers. Proponents of carbon taxes have responded by proposing an approach called fee and dividend. In this approach, funds from the carbon tax or fee are transferred as a tax refund or a dividend given to taxpayers. This way, if polluters pass their costs along to consumers, those consumers will be reimbursed. In theory, the system should provide polluters a financial incentive to reduce emissions while imposing no financial burden on taxpayers and no drag on the economy. Emissions trading programs generally allow participants to buy carbon offsets. These are voluntary payments intended to enable another entity to help reduce the emissions that one is unable to reduce. The payment thus offsets one's own emissions. For example, a coal-burning power plant could pay a reforestation project to plant trees that will soak up much of the carbon dioxide as the coal plant emits. Or a university could fund clean renewable energy products to make up for fossil fuel energy and the university uses. Carbon offsets are popular among utilities and businesses universities, governments, and individuals trying to ach achieve carbon neutrality in which no net carbons emitted. But carbon offsets seem to fall short. Rigorous oversight is needed to make sure that the offset money accomplishes what it's intended for, and offsets must fund emission reductions that would not occur otherwise. Businesses are using carbon offsets to become more sustainable and they can also directly reduce their carbon footprint. Pearson Education became carbon neutral in 2009. 12% savings, energy efficient buildings, computer servers, vehicles, and reductions in business travel happened. 47% savings in buying clean and renewable energy and 41% savings in forest preservation projects around the world. Should we engineer the climate is a good question. What if all our efforts to reduce emissions are not adequate to rein in climate change? As climate changes become more severe, some scientists and engineers are reluctantly considering drastic steps to alter Earth's climate in a last ditch effort to reverse global warming, and this approach is called 
geoengineering. In this case, we suck carbon out of the air by planting trees and fertilizing the ocean with iron. Iron could be a fertilizing agent for phytoplankton. A more high-tech method would be to design artificial trees and structures that chemically filter carbon dioxide out of the air. A different approach would be to block sunlight before it reaches Earth, thereby cooling the planet. We might deflect sunlight by injecting sulfates or other fine dust particles into our stratosphere, by seeding clouds with seawater, or by deploying fleets of reflecting mirrors on land at sea or in orbit in the space. These solutions are technically daunting and are decades away and could have unexpected environmental risks that we don't know about. We need to be careful of hoping for easy technological solutions and only use geoengineering as a backup plan because of all these uncertainties that would exist with this plan. Government policies, corporate action, international treaties, technological innovations, and perhaps even ge geoengineering. Those will all play roles in addressing climate change, but in the end, the most influential factor may be the collective decisions of millions of regular people. Just as we have an ecological footprint, we also have a carbon footprint. That's the amount of carbon that we're responsible for emitting, and people can take steps to decrease their footprint. College students can help to drive personal and societal changes needed to mitigate global climate change. In 2009, 5,200 events were held in 181 nations. This was the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. And global climate change is our biggest challenge. But with action, we can avert the most severe impacts. In conclusion, many factors influence Earth's climate, but human activities play a major role, especially today. Climate change is well underway. Further greenhouse gas emissions will cause severe impacts. More and more people are urging immediate action Reducing greenhouse gas emissions and mitigating and adapting to climate change are the foremost challenges of our society.